We often think about usability when we're designing products, but not accessibility. In today's Build episode, we're going to talk about the importance of accessibility and how to prioritize it regardless of being a startup or a big company. So stay tuned. Welcome to Build, brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Purnima Vijay Shankar. In each episode of Build, I host innovators, and together we debunk a number of myths and misconceptions related to building products, companies, and your career in tech. Now, one often overlooked aspect of building products is accessibility. In today's Build episode, we're going to talk about what accessibility is, why it's important, and how you can do an accessibility audit for your product. And to help us out, I've invited Laura Allen, who is a accessibility program manager at Google for Chrome and the Chrome operating system. Thanks for joining us today, Laura. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Sure. <laughs> so I know that a lot of times people think about usability when they're building products, but they don't often think about accessibility. Let's talk about what is accessibility and how is it different from usability? Sure. So accessibility is you know, the design of products, services, devices, and environments for people with disabilities. And I always like to kind of take that one step further mm -hmm. and think about accessibility as really empowering users with disabilities to be productive, to be socially engaged, and to be independent. Um, and this is super closely aligned with the concept of usability mm -hmm. and also even just you know, universal design and inclusive design. Um, you think about universal design being this idea of you know, building products that are going to be usable by the widest range of people in the widest range of situations. And you know, it's so closely aligned with this, like that absolutely includes designing for people with disabilities. Um, and this whole concept of usability, I mean, yes, it's critical to be thinking about all the time, of course, but mm -hmm. we can make products functionally accessible. We can go through checklists, we can incorporate design principles and whatnot to make things technically work. But if you don't think about, okay, well, how is this actually going to be used? Like, what is the experience for someone with assistive technology, like a screen reader, for example? If you don't think about that experience and the usability of that experience, it might not be productive or efficient at all. So all these things are really closely linked together, and they all help to, to move towards building an inclusive product. So why is this even important? You know, I think a lot of people would say, oh, we have a really niche customer base. We don't think anybody has you know, accessibility concerns. So why even bother? Sure. I mean, accessibility is something that impacts everyone mm -hmm. at some phase or at some point in their life. And so 15% of the global population has some form of a disability. That's a huge number. Mm -hmm. That's over a billion people. Yeah. Um, and you know, when we tend to kind of think about a few different distinct groups when we're thinking about design. So we might be thinking about people who are low vision or blind, mm -hmm. people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, people who have motor dexterity challenges, um, and then people who are what we consider to be kind of neurologically diverse. That can be anything ranging from dyslexia to, you know, perhaps being on the autism spectrum to any forms of intellectual disabilities. And when you think about these different groups of people, you know, people might be developing disabilities at different phases of their life, mm -hmm. different severity levels, uh, different combinations of disabilities. And then you start to think about, OK, well, what about temporary impairments? Like, what if you break your arm and all of a sudden you can't type on your computer yeah, um, for a few months? Um, situational impairments, like, OK, what if you're at a loud restaurant or a loud bar and there's something on the TV that you want to be listening to? It's too loud to hear. And you have to actually rely on those captions that mm -hmm. were there specifically for the deaf population, but they're helpful to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then you take it one step further and you think about this growing aging population, um, which, you know, thanks to increasing life expectancy, which is great, uh, the aging population of people over 60 is growing and growing and growing. And, you know, the World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, there'll be over 2 billion people that are over the age of 60. Oh, wow. So it's like doubling. Absolutely. Like, hopefully not. But yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and as we all age, you know, at any point in our lives, we may experience some slight deteriorations of vision or of hearing or of dexterity. So these concepts are really, really critical to be building in, um, in general. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So now some would say that this makes sense for really big companies with hundreds of millions of users, but does it really make sense for you know, our tiny little startup that's just getting started? Yeah, so I would honestly say accessibility is something that is critical for all companies mm -hmm. at all stages, all phases. 
Um, and to be totally honest with you, it's actually easier to build okay. this in for startup sized companies, smaller teams, smaller processes. Of course, it's completely doable at large companies as well that have kind of established processes. But at a startup, you're kind of you're building from the ground up. You're defining what you want your product processes to look like. And it's so much better just to be able to integrate accessibility in at that level, mm -hmm. get people kind of understanding what these concepts are, make this just a core part of inclusive design from the very beginning, and it'll be that much easier as you grow and grow and grow. Yes. And another thing to think about here is, you know, accessibility, because it impacts such a large number of people, this presents honestly a growth opportunity yeah. in many cases. Um, it, it just opens doors for a lot more business, a lot, a lot of growth potentially. Um, and one thing that I like to think about, especially for startups and just hiring in general, mm -hmm. if companies are focused on actually making their own products accessible, then it opens the doors as well for being able to hire a more diverse and inclusive workforce. So you can hire assistive technology users and have them come in and be able to use your products. Um, and that opens the door. Like a lot of us, obviously, at companies, we're thinking about how do we further diversify? How do we get people in the room who have a diverse set of perspectives? And this whole idea of diversity, I mean, a lot of times we're thinking about race and ethnicity and gender, sexual orientation. But disability is a huge part of this. Yeah. That is a very, very big part of this group, and we need a voice. So, nice. so yeah, yeah, making it into your process, your priorities, your core values can really open doors for you in terms of your, your customer base, making things hopefully easier as you Abs grow. Absolutely. And I will say, too, like for a lot of people, like mm -hmm. I mentioned before, accessibility will touch everybody at some point. And in many cases, it'll make the experience better and more usable for many, many, many users. Mm -hmm. But for someone like me, um, yeah. so I happen to be low vision myself. Um, what does that mean, low vision? Yeah, so really good question because it can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, so for me, I basically have a central vision disorder. So if you can imagine, like, all of my peripheral vision is still intact, mm -hmm. it's still clear. But anything I'm looking directly at mm -hmm. is kind of this blend of flashing lights and, and okay. distortion and blur yeah. and whatnot. Um, and this all kind of happened for me when I was about 14. Mm -hmm. Happened really quickly, really rare condition. Um, so I basically went from having typical 2020 vision mm -hmm. to being what's considered you know, legally blind within about a week when oh, I was wow. 14. And at that point, it was like, all right, I'm getting ready for high school and all of a sudden going to be moving to a bigger school. And then, OK, what happens? Like you can't I couldn't read a book at that point. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see a blackboard. I couldn't recognize faces in the hallway. And uh, it was a huge period of transition uh, for me and for my family. Mm -hmm. And for a few years there, it was one of those things where if materials weren't actually accessible in formats that I could listen to, for mm -hmm. example, instead of visually read, I was stuck. And I had to literally come home from school and my parents and my brother would read to me. And that to me was like the definition of dependence. And I really, really hated it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so fortunate to have a family that was able to help me that way. It was mm -hmm. just unbelievable the amount of effort they went through to get me through to the point where then I was able to kind of regain my independence through discovering assistive technology like text-to-speech software or magnification or a larger mouse cursor, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so it was that, that kind of period of my life that really propelled me into this world of accessibility and usability because I saw the huge potential of what technology can do for someone's life. Mm -hmm. And I just want to help to make that better for the, the rest of the world. Yeah, well, it's, it's great to hear you have a, a personal stake and it yeah. in inspires you know, all, everybody out there, but it also inspires you to realize and relate to people who might also be having these sort of conditions. So that's wonderful to hear. So for people in our audience out there who are building products, how can they get started? How can they prioritize this and gain the benefits? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a lot of different things to be considering. And one thing that I would recommend is kind of doing an audit, mm -hmm. understanding, you know, where is your product right now? What's mm -hmm. the level? And this may vary, you know, if you haven't really been thinking about accessibility yet, that's okay. I mean, it's it's kind of a good opportunity to kind of look at the holistic picture and see what's going on, what bugs you may have. Um, and I would recommend just kind of going through and leveraging a lot of the different resources that are out there okay. um, and using those to kind of create your own audit, however that works for you. So mm -hmm. for example, um, there's a great resource out there uh, from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. We kind of abbreviate, 
abbreviate that to WCAG. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and this is a W3C standard, mm -hmm. Guidelines for Accessibility. And they've been really widely adopted by a lot of designers, engineers, companies. Um, and they're wonderful. They kind of outline different steps and different things to be considering. So for example, they kind of break it down into four different categories. So perceivable, mm -hmm. operable, understandable, and robust. And each of these things has a lot of different checkpoints. But just as a brief example, like when we think about perceivable, um, you know, what sort of assumptions are you making about your users, basically? Like, what are we assuming that they can perceive? Mm -hmm. Are we assuming they have perfect sight or sight at all? Um, are we assuming that they can hear? So thinking about how they're perceiving the product and then different design guidelines that kind of go hand in hand with that. Um, operable, similar, similarly, is kind of like, you know, what are we assuming about the users, who, that, how they're actually operating with the product? So are we assuming they have really fine motor skills, that they can use a mouse, that they can use a keyboard? Um, are we assuming that they have, are able to use really quick reaction times, things like that? Um, understandable, you know, what is the general understandability of the product? Um, are you assuming really high language skills to be able to navigate? Or the ability to just kind of remember really complex sequences, um, all kinds of things like that. And then robust is a little bit different in that it kind of talks about, you know, how is your product working with assistive technology, like a screen reader, for example, which would be leveraged by someone who's blind to be able to listen to the product, listen to the, the phone or the computer, whatever it may be, um, and get that kind of audio output instead of the visual Nice. So yeah, the WCAG is a great resource. Um, I kind of tend to think when I'm kind of thinking about checklists and working with um, designers and whatnot, I kind of break down into a few key groups as well. Mm -hmm. um, the first around keyboard and focus, uh, just really taking a quick poll of, okay, well, let's say you've got a site. How does it work with just the keyboard? Like no mouse whatsoever. Um, and it's a great thing for uh, engineers and designers to be able to kind of try that out themselves as well. Like just, just try using the keyboard only. And as you're navigating through, you know, can you get to everything that you need to? Can you also see visual focus indication? Because mm -hmm. if you don't see that um, and you're just kind of tabbing through and you don't know what you can actually take action on, right? So have you thought about that in the design process basically? Then I kind of start to think about semantics and how do we actually make it more clear uh, for screen reader users, uh, what the page is actually all about or what the app is all about. So for example, like, do we have labels in place mm -hmm. for buttons so that as you navigate with the screen reader, you don't just hear button <laughs> or unlabeled button, which is not helpful mm -hmm. at all, right? So thinking about how do we just convey that experience and make sure that it's clear for a screen reader. And then a third bucket, which I like to think about in my audits, is just kind of like this idea of flexible interface. So that can be anything from color contrast. So WCAG actually says, you know, we should have a minimum color contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1 mm -hmm. for text against its background color. And that's super helpful because for anyone like me with low vision or just anyone who doesn't have the perfect 2020 vision, it can be really hard to actually distinguish those colors or low contrast text. So that's a really helpful usability improvement for a lot of people. Um, and in the same group of flexible UI, you think about things like, okay, how does this interface look with magnification at a 200% zoom level, for example? Or are we using just color or just sound to convey information? So just color, one example there is like, okay, if you have an input field and you type an error and all of a sudden, maybe just the text will appear red. Mm -hmm. And in that case, people who can't distinguish color will miss that information. Um, screen reader users or braille readers will completely miss that information as well. So thinking about, you know, how do you go step one step further and convey that and make sure there's also error messaging. So you can still use the color red and all, that's fine, but it can't be the only way that you're identifying that information. So I like to kind of think through questions like that, um, using the WCAG guidelines and other things out there. Like I know Vox Media has a really great checklist. Um, and just kind of take, get a sense of where is the current level. And from that point, you may have a lot of different bugs. You may have different different things that you want to be able to address. And the next step is naturally to work on how do you triage this? Mm -hmm. How do you prioritize? Um, and I think one really helpful thing to do there is just to think about each of these bugs, like what is the typical user impact? 
like how critical is this? Would this this bug stop somebody from being able to actually interact or take action on your site and like your your kind of core purpose of your site or your app, right? So I like to think about that and help to prioritize and just kind of go from there. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, we'll be also sure to include the resources you mentioned sure. below in the in the show notes. So you mentioned a number of things that happen during the audit. What happens after the audit? Yeah, so I think the next natural step, of course, is going through that triage and prioritization mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of like as you're solving these problems, as you're fixing bugs, continuing to go through um, and help to honestly integrate accessibility into each step of the process. I think that's the really critical step. Um, one holistic audit is not going to take you all the way, right. right? We have to start bringing this into our development process and building it from the ground up. Um, and then honestly getting out there and working with users, mm -hmm. understanding what the feedback is. I think that's a really critical component to understanding you know, how to improve. So I know in the next episode, we're going to be going into a little bit more detail and boiling it down for our viewers out there. Thank you so much today for joining us, Laura. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Now, Laura and I want to know, how does your company handle accessibility? Let us know in the comments below. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode where we'll dive in a little bit deeper and share three key tips that you want to think about when designing for accessibility. And thanks so much to our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for their help in producing this episode. Ciao for now. This episode of Build is brought to you by our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker. Welcome to Femgineer's Confident Communicator course introductory video series. I'm Pornima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. And I'm Karen Catlin, a former tech executive who's now an advocate for women who are working in the tech industry. For the last 22 years, I have been speaking in public and for the last eight within the tech industry. I have given a TEDx talk. I've been a guest lecturer at Duke's Pratt School of Engineering, an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups, a mentor in residence at Techstars, and was the founding engineer of Mint.com. I am on my second career. In my first career, I spent 25 years building software products. I started out as a software engineer and over time moved to the executive level where I was a vice president at Adobe Systems. Now in my second career, I'm an advocate for women, which means I do a lot of public speaking about diversity, about women's leadership topics, and I've given a TEDx talk. The Confident Communicator course is a live online course that Karen and I co-teach together in this video series, we're going to give you a sense of what the Confident Communicator course is and what you'll get out of it. You'll learn about the challenges Pornima and I have faced learning the craft of public speaking ourselves. You'll learn why we decided we just couldn't keep all of this knowledge to ourselves. And you'll hear from students who have taken the class about how they have become more confident communicators. You're going to get a behind the scenes look at the entire course. You'll meet some past students and see how they went from being shy and nervous to poised and confident communicators. You're also going to meet employers and sponsors who found the course valuable enough to invest in and send their people. And finally, you'll get some sample lessons so you know the material that we're going to be covering. Sign up below to receive the first lesson immediately where you'll understand why it's not good enough to just be heads down you need to speak up to get the recognition you deserve. Ciao for now.